I would like to start um, with my journey, which may not just be calculated from the time that I won the Miss India or the Miss World title, but um, really also where I feel our lineage or our ancestors come from. And so I would love to recollect uh, what happened to India or what happened for us around the 15th of August, 1947. We may all recollect that time as the time that India got its independence from a very, very long struggle uh, against the British Raj or the British regime. Um, but what really stands out for me was the way that my grandfather had to sit on an aeroplane with my father with very little money, having left their home completely on that side of India and start life afresh in what was now the free India. As my grandfather used to recount these stories of how they started from scratch and how my father used to recount his early childhood days, it used to leave me wondering, what are we doing with our freedom today? And what does independence mean to me as a young girl or a woman of India at this point of the century? What was also very interesting and fascinating was the fact that my grandfather used to, he was a lawyer, and he used to read the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Bible, and the, the holy text of the Sikh people, the Guru Granth Sahib. He used to tell me stories in Punjabi, and we would both sit and really be in amazement and wonder at these legendary tales of Lord Rama, of Lord Krishna, of Guru Nanak and his disciples. And I remember crying with him because these stories would move me and they would really bring forth certain qualities or certain virtues or certain divine values that we all hold very true to our hearts. But as a young child, I wasn't able to articulate what were my questions towards life. What did spiritual freedom mean? And what did freedom as an Indian citizen mean? And of course, I held these questions as I grew up. What also made a very, very deep and profound impression on me was reading Mahatma Gandhi's My Experiments with Truth. And for a really long time, I wondered, what was my movement of nonviolence? If I had to say, this is my satyagraha, what is my truth? And how may I speak it fearlessly and most lovingly? How can I come from a place of compassion and empathy to the suffering and the pain of others around me? Of course, these questions were also combined with my own journey as a student, just like you guys are here today. Um, I went through an intense struggle of wondering, is it justified that certain academic success or achieving a um, certain amount of degrees or pedigrees in the field of education define my intelligence? Um, do I really have to write so many homework assignments? And with that struggle, I remember, and I'd love to share this incident with you, that I, I did top my class as a student, and I was, you know, I used to participate in a lot of uh, extracurricular activities as well. I remember once when I was probably in the ninth or the tenth grade, and uh, I argued back with my teacher, uh, merely because she didn't entertain my question, and I said that tomato is not a vegetable, but rather a fruit. Uh, of course, the discussion went into something that was not very welcomed and received by the authority figure in the classroom. And that got me wondering, that is true freedom merely accepting some form of information that is being given to me? Or am I allowed to question the truth? What is true for me and what is not? As these questions lived on, I went on to compete for the pageants when I went into college. Uh, I won the Miss India, I won the Miss World as well, with the blessings of my guru. And these questions were still living and still breathing, and they were getting stronger and stronger within me. What was also a very, very vital part of my journey was that I had grown up since the age of 14 
spent my summers uh, observing spiritual practices and offering selfless service in my Guru's ashram. What we have always understood in the Indian context as the Gurukula uh, is really defined by the Guru Shishya Parampara, which means the master and the disciple relationship, which when we look to the Western world, we see in biblical language with Jesus and his disciples or with Buddha and his students as well. And that to me felt was truly at the heart of what education should be about. That the love uh, a student has for their teacher, the reverence with which a teacher welcomes the student into her life or his life and cultivates and nurtures this young mind. What really propelled my journey into a very, very deep research was when I became a mother. As a parent, I really questioned, is this what I want for my child? And is this education system or is this way of growing up with social conditioning and norms and expectations or pressures of performances going to truly do justice to what is his potential or what was the reason for his birth? And what happened was truly wonderful. All my questions slowly started getting answered. I met something called Waldorf education. And what it really is, is defining to us in, from, from the West coming in a very beautiful way, how we can lay these um, spiritual pillars, if we may say, as the foundation of an educational system. And really look at a child's journey from the process of being born, to crawling, to standing, to walking, to being able to speak. How can we nurture and nourish a child's senses in a very holistic way? How can I not just te teach to his intellect? And what is really happening to us when we're just mastering certain concepts or certain ideas or academic researches that we seem to be doing is that we're almost moving outside of ourselves. And we, I found that we've kind of lost that connect with our own soul. We're trying to fill up this void. We're trying to fill up this emptiness by seeking some form of information or some form of entertainment or some form of uh, achievement, if we may say, from the outside, which is wonderful and great because the human mind has such brilliant ideas and science and medical field has made such wonderful progress. But we also have to look within ourselves as to what are these qualities and what are these virtues that I want to live my life by. So coming back to world of education, it really helped me understand the value of storytelling. When we look at a young child and we see how they learn really is through imitation and through stories. This is exactly what the scriptures have laid out in most religious practices as well. That when a master or a spiritual teacher has to impart a guidance for you to live your life, they really want you to see it in a very organic, in a very natural way. And of course, I recollected the stories that my grandfather used to tell me. And I also recollected the stories that I've heard from my own guru. What seemed more beautiful in today's day and age is that we have to now consider how does the human mind work? How does the human brain really receive information? How does it process it? And of course, there's immense amount of data on that, whether you study it as a profession or you study it just as an interest. Um, so I'm going to take you through a few of these interesting presentations. And we're also looking at how stories can be an educational tool. We're also looking at how stories can be a medium of healing the human heart. And how can we create a community within ourselves where we grew up on stories of brotherhood and peace and love and forgiveness and gratitude? And how can we become more connected and whole as a humanity? How can we get off our digital screens and really start communicating to the heart of another? In the world of kindergarten, or rather in early childhood, as we call it, up until the age of seven, 
academics is not brought in at all. Storytelling is all about telling the child what he's already experienced within himself, but yet cannot art articulate. And so what was beautiful in my discovery and research was that Grimm's fairy tales bring these truths to us in a very, very truthful way. From the grades upwards, children are then taught um, how these stories can become alphabets, numbers. Um, they're also taught through drawing them, painting them. If they were to do a max timetables, they would walk it forwards and backwards. And so matching it with the latest scientific brain research, or what neuroscience says, is that when we allow children to have these kind of movements, and when we create an environment of telling a story with a certain tone of voice, or a certain control over the breath, creating the mood in the classroom, allows the child's mind to become very centered, very still, and very engaged into the whole picture of the story. A human soul can really relate to these spiritual truths and wisdoms, and they become like little seeds that are planted in our consciousness that will blossom and flower at their own time. And they will take their own shape as the child grows up into a, a young teenager, an adult, and goes on to achieve whatever they have to achieve as far as their own personal life journey is concerned. So let's look at a few of the um, art. representations, which show us how we're not trying to put the human mind into a box. We're not trying to get them to fit into what we may call is beautiful and let the colors just flow and let them merge with each other. So this is something that is traditionally called wet on wet, but veil painting. And maybe just one color is used. Here we have the alphabets that I was mentioning to you. And so a story is told to a child over a period of three days. We also learn from uh, neuroscience that repetition in a rhythmic manner allows for the child to recollect those images at will. So these are not imposed images, which in today's digital world, they're very highly exposed to. But we do require to stimulate the brain in a very, very natural and organic way. And so as you see that the letter B is emerging out of a story that had the character of a bear in it. We'll also now move on to see a blackboard drawing depicting how the teacher herself or himself is an artist and how the teacher can very creatively through art and music, engage children through storytelling and really lead them on in their academic curriculum. And these are pictures of children playing in nature. So that could be um, children about the age of five or six. These are children probably eight or nine years old. And what we also understand from research with regards to learning difficulties that children may have, which we very um, conveniently may label as autistic or attention deficit disorder, or we may call them as dyslexic, that the fact is that the child is having their own process of becoming very comfortable in their body. How do we allow a child to first gain this self-mastery over his body? It's only when he's able to feel physically comfortable that he would be able to then master the art of sitting in a chair and listening to a teacher and being able to write that down in his book. But what is very fiercely lacking today, which we really need to also address, is the fact that children are not getting as much movement and the brain really does learn through movement. So what they did find in their studies and research was that um, children with these learning difficulties and also adults who may not have these uh, learning difficulties or these labels given to them are 
receiving the benefits of being with, in contact with nature. What does nature do? How can a tree or being with a plant or merely observing a bee or a butterfly allow me to have something which we may call a sustained period of attention? It's because when we are in nature, there are certain forces of nature that work upon us, on our minds, and bring down or reduce the levels of anxiety and stress. When my mind is much more relaxed, when my body is much more relaxed, I'm able to develop what we call a natural way of learning from the environment. And this is at the heart of the education system, where we do need this joy for learning, this absolute enthusiasm for what we want to do with our lives, or what ideas we may have, or what plans we may make with our classmates, or create a project and learn how to be in, in a team. So brain research also shows us that when neural pathways are stimulated in a certain manner through movement, through nature, through storytelling, we are able to then integrate all that we learn and we're able to apply it in a way that these skills also then help us navigate through the different challenges of life. And this is how I came to answer what my questions were. It seemed to me that the true meaning of life or the true purpose of life really is to recognize that there's a certain divine force within me. And that same divine force is within each and every person I meet and each and every living creature or being that I encounter. It may also be in what we call the inanimate objects because everything has life in it and everything is breathing life through it, with it. <laughs>